Over the years, over in fact millions of years, many plants have become adapted to fire and they actually depend on fire. And if you didn't have fire, then those plants wouldn't continue to grow in our reserves. Fire and the Australian bush are interlinked and, and that goes right back to Aboriginal culture and their use of fire stick farming. We're going to light a fire. It still contains a fair bit of moisture at the moment. We're just going to wait until she dries out a little bit. So the, the bush comes back. Basically the Australian bush needs to be burnt every 15, 20 years and there's two reasonings for doing this. For ecology it is really important that the Australian bush gets burnt. And this area hasn't been burnt for a good 20 odd years. It's become a bit stagnant over that time. There certain species are starting to dominate. We've had a lot of casuarina come up through this part of the reserve. All the needles that they've dropped and that's been causing a lot of stagnation with the regeneration. Another reason is asset protection. It's really important that council takes the responsibility to protect properties. It needs awareness of the fire history of an area because if you do asset protection and burn areas very frequently, you'll actually lose the seed bank that's on that site. You often lose collections of plants that are vulnerable. We have one which is a banksia. If you burn too frequently, you'll lose it, and if you leave it for too long, we'll lose it. The key basically is not to burn in one spot too regularly. Those sort of ideas are always in our mind when we're assessing sites like these. So we do small pocket burns over many years, and in that way it enables the species to migrate great back into the burn site after it's been burnt. A lot of our areas haven't been burnt for 60, 70, 80 years. We're kind of behind in a way that we have to look at scheduling burns over a long period to catch up for that lack of fire that we've had in our reserves. Now the gear today will be helmets, bushfire jackets, um, yellow pants are optional. Where we are now is called the Little Sugarloaf of Sugarloaf Bay. So we're at the second highest point in all of Sugarloaf Bay. I'll use two lighting teams and we'll pretty much get in pretty quickly up the Nile, get that going. We're really lucky in Willoughby, we've got 300 hectares of bushland and this particular site was lucky to be preserved because of an explosive store. Now the weather's good, we've got no breeze whatsoever. Basically if the explosives that were kept in Mantry Bay blew up, all the land around that area that would have been destroyed was kept as bushland. Because of that, we were left with these really nice bushland pockets. The site here is shown in green on this map. It's about four hectares. We've put a lot of work in the burn preparation. We went through and chopped down a lot of the younger casuarinas that will be used for fuel. You can see here that the mid-storey has been cut and laid on the ground. This dries out over a few months and increases the fuel load ready for the burn. We're hoping the burn today will remove a lot of that leaf litter and allow species that were here before to come back, like the scribbly gums, the bloodwoods, and all sort of the understory species. A lot of the banksias and other native plants have pods, and the fire and the smoke and the heat stimulates those pods to open and the seeds to fall out. That seed bank that is in the soil will respond to the burning. And even a lot of native animals need fire to help them breed. Bandicoots come in and eat the fungi, which really spreads after the fire. If you lack fire, species start to disappear from the reserve system. How we do it is by cutting fire lines. And these lines are basically big cleared sections which are cut into the bush. We'll have staff that are along this area with hoses and drip torches. And this is how the fire is controlled. This is the boundary of the burn site. I suppose there's a lot of emotion involved with fire and sometimes residents will ask us why don't you burn off that bit like next week, why don't you do that straight away and it's often a very um, much more long term process. The window of opportunity for doing these hazard reduction burns or prescribed burns as we call them is very very narrow. It's just not something you come along and throw a match in and light it up. There's a lot of groundwork that goes on. So for example if we've had rain for a period of time it will perhaps limit the potential of that site. On the other hand there might be a lot of pressure to actually achieve a burn to a timetable. So it's trying to 
balance all of those influences. Now the objective of this burn is to light her up and let it sit as long as possible to get the heat into the ground and into the depth of regeneration. The burning is done by trained professionals who know about lighting patterns so that they get an optimal result. Our hazard reduction crew at Council prepare this whole burn and get it ready, but then on the actual day we're supported by the local fire brigade. There's been quite a bit of preparation work and uh, it's just good to be finally burning. It all came out of the 94 fires. The fires that happened in 1994 were a big scare for people living in Sydney and people were thinking now, wow, we've got fires right on our doorstep. The 94 fires showed the inadequacies that were in place for urban bushland management. It was a request to form bushfire management committees throughout the Sydney region. Who's actually on that group? The group is made up of four councils, our neighbours Lane Cove, Hunters Hill and Ride. And it's actually put together by the New South Wales Fire Brigade and other interested parties that adjoin our bushland, like such as national, national parks. parks. Yeah. So that really means that our work in a local reserve like this here at Explosives Reserve is part of a regional planning process. It's not just our bushland that stops at a border, but it's a continuous system that runs through several council areas. And it's particularly important when planning burns to know exactly what each other's doing. All of these burns are submitted to this committee for approval. The aspect, the slope, the topography, the type of vegetation will be a crucial issue to help us determine where that burning should take place. The assessment of the fuel loads is really important too. Some areas haven't burned for a period of maybe 50 years. That's quite a detailed process which then leads into the next stage which is then to work out what size of burn, how that will be divided into particular portions, what season it would be prepared. I mean the actual preparation of the burn is as important as the burn itself. And then to determine the exact area which is then fine-tuned even further to perhaps exclude particular portions that might be important from a habitat point of view and really to think about what the impact of the fire will be in terms of the season when the fire is actually burned. For something like explosives, for example, where we're sitting, we would never burn this in a spring or a summertime. To do those in the middle of summer, particularly when there's a likelihood of strong wind, would be a dangerous thing to do. But also for things like birds that are just hatching out of the nest and are unable to fly, we could wipe out a generation of those animals. And that's also why we don't do massive burns in winter. There's reptiles which are a bit sleepy, they'll be hiding. You've got all your insects in pupa, your butterflies. We can, however, do our burns in areas which are smaller at those times if the conditions are right. In between seasons is a really good time to burn. The middle of winter is quite damp, so you don't get the really hot, intense burns which are good at reducing the fuel loads and promoting regeneration. We do lose a percentage of beetles and spiders and things like that. Most of your little lizards get out, they jump under rocks. We saw ring-tailed possums creeping out of their drays. If they needed any help, we were trying to ensure that they went away from the flames. The way we light up, we always leave corridors, exits for them to get out, because they get out pretty quickly. Although it's quite dramatic and there's a lot of damage done in a burn, the Australian bush has this amazing ability basically to cope and you actually end up with more species after a fire than you do before. There are going to be plenty of spotters around to make sure that the embers don't fly over to the other reserves, fire units all along the road and using all the hydrants near the houses. We've got about 25 of our people, New South Wales Fire Brigades and 12 of the council team. We all work in together and get the job done. Today I'm the incident controller for this hazard reduction burn. I monitor the situation throughout the day. Not only do we burn to take away the fine fuels which a wildfire or bushfire feeds on, we actually like to get enough heat into the ground so we're promoting germination and regeneration of native plants. This sort of burn will stimulate flowering and seeding. 
and flowers and seeds certainly bring birds and, and mammals. It's amazing to come back six months down the track and just see the ground layer and all of this amazing diversity of seedlings that comes back. We're going to let this burn down rather than putting it out with the hoses. That certainly saves a lot of water and it gets the heat into the soil which is beneficial for germination of native plant species. You really don't get regeneration without some sort of disturbance. Smoke and fire and heat is one of the most satisfactory and, and easiest ways to break the dormancy in native seeds. Just going to take the last section out now, which is the southwesterly side. The primary function of the hazard reduction team, as in the title suggests, was to reduce the hazard. And sort of an unsaid thing is the ecological outcome that these burns are producing. I think in our team's work here, we see the ecological benefits of fire as being really important important, as important as the asset protection. The two processes of hazard reduction and ecological burning are one in the same for us now. You can see that there's a whole range of different types of burns which Willoughby Council's fire hazard reduction team has been involved with. These smaller burns are called pile burns and I guess the most innocent version is almost like a kid's bonfire and sometimes kids do establish some of our burn sites for us without us really knowing about them and then we come back and see ah oh, there's been a burn here hasn't that been helpful. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so helpful. Strip burns are another example which are typically a longer linear burn adjacent to property boundaries. In weedy degraded areas, particularly in our strip burns behind houses, we will usually get something of ecological benefit. This bushland's slowly dying. There's still a few remnant species in there and we want to see if we can bring it back to what it was. Some months after we've conducted a burn, the bush comes back really quite thick. Everything has to be cut down because there's actually no fuel on the ground. If we burnt this as it is now, you wouldn't even light anything. So what we're doing is cutting all this privet and any understory down, wait till the timber season and then burn it. The fire team, in essence, is really a bush regeneration team, but rather than just weeding, they're using fire to help promote diversity of plants. Most of the vegetation in here is exotic. We're burning it to see if we can stimulate the local species back. All of our staff members spend time on the fire crew. We now have 14 of them who are able to carry out these burns. We'll set fire to this bush here and afterwards we'll physically come and cut or hand remove the weeds as they emerge to allow the natives to come through strongest. The fuel is prepared, things are cut down, dried and then the actual process of burning will then produce an open understory which will still have canopy trees in it but which will be easier to manage in terms of the levels of risk that otherwise might occur there. We're trying to get back diversity here and burning is the best way to do it. Often it's like starting with a blank canvas. Once you get rid of those weeds, you can reintroduce species from the local area into that, that zone. And then of course there are much broader scale burns, which, you know, like here at Explosives, it involves many hectares. Successful burn today, George. Yeah, not too bad. This little section here is just a little bit damp, but it'll still smile away for a while. It'll get in. Up to top the knoll, we've got a really good deep burn, good penetration into the ground, and we slowly worked our way down. Once a year we're trying to program a substantial size burn in our most fire prone areas. That of course involves a lot more resourcing, involves a lot more preparation, and also involves a lot more potential maintenance afterwards if it's in a site which has a problem of annual weeds. And we got most of the fuel <coughs> off the ground so a lot of native species will Actually, have a yeah. chance to come up through there. Further around towards the northerly and the northwesterly aspect it went really well. You know the Casharina pile? Yep. Well that's burnt right down the ground. We do keep pre and post species lists where we go into a site and record all the plants and animals we can find in the proposed burn area. Then we do it progressively after certain periods of time to really assess what has come back. 
this drawing here shows us where the burns have been and where it's logical to plan for future burns. So it's a really crucial part of the process, isn't it? Yeah, it is crucial. So we can plan our future burns 20, 30 years down the track. Oh, well, we'll still be here then. We'll still be here <laughs> then, and so will the bush. There's one little area around the other side there. All the stuff you cut down there, we just couldn't get enough heat in that little section. Right. So we'll probably do it tomorrow. They so do a bit of a follow-up <coughs> yeah. burn and mop up a few things that are burning yeah. tomorrow and We're keep gonna, an eye yeah. on the site. That's nice white hot. That'll smile away for hours. And the stations that we're working today? I got it on my hand, actually. Yeah. We had uh, Ride, Neutral Bay, Willoughby. Willoughby. And the fly from in town, City of Sydney. Oh, okay. They don't get out much, so they've enjoyed the day. They, right. they sort of chase Cade calls all the time, the poor buggers. So I feel sorry okay. for them. So they're seeing a bit so, of action in the yeah. bush as well. Probably what we'll have to do, like some of these things, Yeah, some of those we'll have to just keep an eye on. We'll probably go through later on and just make sure there's no widow makers. It's been a great result, you know, and it's good when you can actually do a burn and it comes out how you want it. We're here at Explosives Reserve again, this time five months after the initial burn. And as you can see, things are just starting to pop up. The ash has formed a really dense layer, which is a great seed bed. So all those seeds that were in the soil or getting thrown down from the trees above are starting to propagate after we've had lots of rain. After the fire, the immediate impact is, is obviously a moonscape. But one thing we have found is the black cockatoo, they seem to know to come to that spot because you're going to find banksias, hakeas, all their seed capsules opening. For a long period of time, we didn't have fire in this area and we were losing a whole range of species. As a result of having a fire, we've got extraordinary regeneration of those species. The first kind of wildlife response you see after a burn is the ants and the insects. They're coming in and really rejuvenating the soil. They're carrying seeds that have fallen into the soil. Particularly with acacias, because the way that they've been designed is to put a little bit of sugary sap on the end of their seed which will attract the ant. The ant will take it into the nest and it'll discard the seed and that will grow from there. So it's a really fantastic system that's evolved over these millions of years and it's unbelievable to see it in these fragmented urban areas. Grass trees are one of the first plants that you see a little bit of green after the burn. This one here, after five months, you'll notice is almost fully out with its leaves. So they're really quick to respond. All that energy is stored down in the trunk. Also here, we've got lots of grasses starting to come up. The grasses form that nice little bit of green for animals and wildlife to come in and eat. Also helps stabilize the soil if we get a really heavy rainfall, these little seedlings and the early sprouters just hold everything together. So an interesting way to see what wildlife is visiting a burn site is actually to look at their scats or their poo. And we've got here some fresh wallaby poo. It gives us a really good indication that wallabies are starting to re-colonise the site. When we're looking here at the vegetation, you'll notice a big thick layer of dead midstory. And this is mainly the casuarina, which doesn't regrow like the eucalypts after fire. It relies on its seed pods to release seed back into the soil. Although the tree's dead, all the seedlings are just coming up, so that species will come back onto the site. In some cases, the canopy will look like it's died, but in fact it will sprout again, like a lot of the eucalypts. They'll have that typical epicormic growth along the trunks. Here we have what's called epicormic growth on this eucalypt. What happens is the small buds kept under the bark which stay alive after and during the fire and they instantly will start shooting. And this is how the trees will 
come alive again and get their canopy back. And then you'll start to get a very quick growth of the acacias, which will then, in six months' time, they'll quadruple their height. We'll find quite a thick, dense understory, and they're all competing for that light. And obviously, the stronger ones will go on to become dominant. You'll then have some of the canopy trees coming up and gradually taking over what now looks like the dominant understory, and we'll also start to lose again some of the species which depend on a lot of light and sun. The moment there are flannel flowers, which is about six months after the fire. You can see here that we've got the actinotis or flannel flower. Now this beautiful flower which is so iconic of the Sydney bushland really responds to fire. It needs fire to regenerate. So in this site before we burnt you may have had just a few scattered bushes but after we burnt you get these big swathes of wildflowers and flannel flowers. <laughs> Species such as the Christmas bells, which came out probably three to four months after the fire, which people thought was a really a wonderful thing to see because they hadn't been in such abundance for a long time. This guy here is the grey spider flower. Its flowers in detail have these little legs that look like spiders. You won't see it that commonly in the bushland until you get a fire. This site here in Howell Reed Reserve was burnt in 2004. The mid-story is just starting to develop really thickly. We've got our small angophoras here, which are about waist height after three years. They love the nice ash bed that is laid down after a fire. And what happens, the seed from the parent tree will fall down onto this ash bed and that ash will provide nutrients for it to grow up really quite quickly. Three years down the track, we've got really a thicket of bushland that is important for small birds. It provides that shelter that they need for protection from the larger birds, which will prey on them. You've got the acacias, which are now about six, six feet high, and they're the first thing that, that pops up after a fire. You also have the hop bush, which again is another one of those early coloniser plants, which will quickly spread over a burnt area and they really help to stabilise the soil and provide shelter for the other plants that take a little bit longer to grow up. The first season of the next spring, there'll be plants such as the pea family and the proteaceae family. You'll attract a lot of birds to those, you'll have insect life multiplying, and then a year or two later you'll have a, a succession of different species which become dominant until probably 10 years later your canopy species have virtually replaced the ones which were lost at the time prior to the fire. This site was burnt 10 years ago in 1997. You can see that the trees are a lot taller than the three years so we've got a canopy developing and also the mid-story is still quite dense, but just starting to become a little bit more sparse. The regrowth is about halfway up the mature trees that did get burnt, but their leaves have regrown. So it's interesting to know. The early species that we saw in the three-year burn are now starting to die out, and the tree species are starting to take